Good morning. In just a moment, we'll be reading from uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 12. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our morning uh, service, and we've got a wonderful crowd with us today, and uh, we're so delighted that you've all come our way. If you are visiting with us, uh, one of our elders here will be going down the aisle. And uh, he, if you'll raise your hand, he's got some information on the church. Uh, and if there's inside, there's a little visitor's card. If you don't care to fill it out and pass it to the center aisle. Okay. Now for our reading. And this is a good reading as Peter senses that his life is soon to be coming to an end. And it shows that his care... For those, as he puts in verse 1, of the like precious faith, that's who he's thinking about. And oftentimes as our life goes to a close, we begin to think about those uh, and the legacy. And uh, Peter is certainly concerned as well. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Now, Brother Johnny will lead us in song service. Number 732. 732. We'll sing the first and last verses. <clears throat> We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who Number 680, <clears throat> 680, we'll sing the first and last verses. Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, thankful for every good and perfect gift that you've given to us. Father, we're thankful for the beauty of this day and for the 
opportunity to gather together to worship you, we pray in spirit and in truth. We're so thankful, Father, that many of our members who have been away from us are able to be back this morning. We pray for their continued health. We pray for those who are not able to be with us due to sickness and health concerns. We pray that you'll bless and comfort them. Bless those, Father, who are going through trials and struggles that we may not be aware of. We know that every individual faces their own challenges in this life, and we pray that we we'll, as fellow brothers and Christ, sisters in Christ will lift each other up and encourage one another to face the struggles of the day. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless the congregation of your people here at Carthage. Bless each of us as we serve. We, we pray, Father, that we'll do so in unity and that the borders of your kingdom will be spread as a result of the efforts of this congregation. Bless our missionaries that serve in foreign lands. We pray that you'll be with them, Father, as they spread the word across the world. We pray, Father, at this time a blessing on our nation. We pray that you'll bless those who are in seats of authority. Give them wisdom, Father, to make decisions that would lead our country closer to you. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless us as we go throughout this service. Help us, Father, to focus on your word and may good and honest hearts receive these things that have been presented to us. Bless Edward as he presents a message to us. We pray that you'll continue to be with us as we leave this place and go throughout our lives. We pray forgiveness when we fail thee in these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you're using your book and want to mark it, we're going to use number 179 as our song of encouragement. Number 179. <clears throat> then before the lesson, we're going to sing number 456. 456. <clears throat> No tears in heaven, no sorrows given. I would add my greetings to those that have already been extended to you. We have an excellent number present today. We have, as Chris mentioned in our prayer, several of our members back who have been ill and unable to be with us. <clears throat> we'll be mentioning those later on by name, Lord willing. But we are delighted that you're here, especially if you're visiting with us. We're honored that you have come to be a part of our services this morning. Our ushers have the study guides as usual. They'll be coming down the aisle, and if you would, get their attention and take uh, some notes this morning on our lesson. We will have uh, plenty of material for you to look at and to 
fill out and write down scriptures, we hope, and you'll be able to study those privately and maybe pass some information on to other people as well. Growing up on the farm, we would work really hard to get a particular job done. And quite often, maybe my dad, but more often, my mom would say, well, finally. We finally got it done. I'm going to be preaching on finally this morning. And be aware of the fact that when <clears throat> Paul wrote these words in Ephesians 6, he was not saying to the congregation when this epistle was read before them, all right, it's time to get up and get your coats on now and get all the kids together and be sure you've got everything picked up that you need to take home with you because the service is just about over. <coughs> Preachers see a lot of things, <clears throat> and I have actually seen this occur when somebody or I would say, now in conclusion, people start reaching to gather up all the stuff and the paraphernalia to get their coat on maybe even before the invitation song is even started. They're getting ready. Or when the preacher says, now in conclusion, or finally, my final point <clears throat> is this. People assume that that is the go ahead to get ready to leave. That's not at all what the word signifies in the text that we're going to be reading this morning. Let's begin reading in verse 10 of Ephesians 6. <clears throat> finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As you read these verses, we usually zero in on the Christian's armor, and for good cause, because that is the primary thrust of the passage, it seems. It tells us what we are to wear as Christians so that we might be ready for the battle before us. We are in a fight as children of God. We are fighting against really powerful enemies. Paul says, not even flesh and blood. He goes on to describe what clearly is the forces of evil being led by none other 
than the prince of this world, Satan, and his counterparts. But as we look at this passage, and I don't have my monitor on this morning, so I'll be looking at my slides that I have from what you see on the screen. Paul uses that word finally to denote that we have something else to say that is very important. We may talk about finally finishing a job or finally arriving at our destination when we're on a trip, or maybe even the preacher finally hushed. We use it in those ways, but it doesn't mean that in this passage. Brother J. Lockhart comments on this word in Truth for Today commentary that he penned on the book of Ephesians. And he said that the idea is from now on, from this time the hits forward, in the time that is ahead, whatever time you have left on this earth, here's what you need to do as a child of God. I think that is a very good point to be made. Paul used the word finally <clears throat> in five different passages. Those finally passages, as we will call them, are 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. As Paul neared the end of his writings to the church at Corinth, he said, Finally, brethren, farewell and then went on to give them some very applicable instructions. Then we have this passage that we have used as a text for our lesson today. Finally, my brethren, be strong. It is important that we realize the need for spiritual strength. The Christian life is not for weaklings in the sense of not having courage, not having the will and the desire to stand up for what is right. Or oh, we're all weak in the flesh at one time or another. But we must be strong in the face of the opposition that we face so as not to be easily overwhelmed. In Philippians 3 verse 1, Paul would say, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It's important that as Christians we understand the concept of joy. We have so many reasons to rejoice. That rejoicing takes place in the Lord. That's the reason we should be rejoicing. That we can in Him find the strength that we need to endure and to persevere under adverse circumstances. In Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are pure and true and lovely of good report, all those things that Paul lists, think on these things. Get your mind in the right place. Be sure you're focused, that you know and understand what is truly important in this life. And don't allow yourself to be sidetracked. Dwell on these things. Do you think we need that ad admonition today? With all of the, for lack of a better word, garbage that's being thrown out there? Many years ago, I used the illustration of a mother who was trying to get the point across to her daughter that she did not need to go and see a particular popular movie, a movie that was being talked about, you know, and everybody was going to see it, and, and her mother was not good with that. She said, honey, you don't need to do that. They happened to be in the kitchen preparing the evening meal. The daughter was defending her position. The mother was not giving any ground. You just don't need to do that. Her mother just reached over and got the garbage bowl and dumped it into the dish 
that she was preparing. And the daughter just went berserk. Mother, what do you think you're doing? She said, honey, if you don't mind your mind being filled with garbage, you shouldn't mind eating garbage. Good point. Think on things that are good, pure, honest, true, lovely, of good report. Those are the things we need to dwell on. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Paul would say, brethren, or finally, brethren, pray for us. Much as he does in our text, he asked the Ephesian brethren to pray for him as a preacher of the gospel, that he might have free course, that the word might have free course, and that he might have the opportunity to preach and teach the truth. In this passage from Ephesians 6, I want you to notice first of all the charge that is given. Be strong in the Lord. How many times has Paul emphasized that in the book of Ephesians? I think it's about 36 times, but go back and count them. Read it and mark it. Note how many times, how many references are made to being in Christ. Our strength comes from the Lord. Not from ourselves. If we had been able to make it on our own, there would have been no need for the Lord to have come to this earth. But He did come so that we might receive strength in due time. In order to be able to live faithfully the Christian life. And the power of His might. If I remember correctly, the word that has to do with strength and the word it has to do with power here are pretty well synonymous in the original language. Paul often does that to emphasize the importance of a point. He says, put on the whole armor of God. <clears throat> Some translations have full armor. The word armor <clears throat> comes from the Greek term panoplia, from which we get our word uh, panoply. And we have that word, I think, in one of the songs that we sing sometimes. But it's talking about the complete set of armor. Don't leave off anything. It's very important that we put on the whole armor of God. That is our charge. That's what the Lord wants us to do. You'll notice the description given to the foe that we mentioned briefly a minute ago reveals to us that the foe should never be underestimated. Have you ever seen two athletic teams on the field of endeavor and, and uh, one is, let's say, number one in whatever league or area they're in. And the other one is a very suspect team, just, you know, not very highly rated. They don't have any stars. And we all know that that's an upset in the making, especially as happened in reference to one team that I remember years ago. They were so overconfident as they were warming up. And they'd point down to the other end like, why are we playing those guys, you know? When the game ended, guess who walked off the floor with their heads down? You know, the big powerful team were beaten. And they had just been so cocky, overconfident, as we use those words. We're never to underestimate our enemy. Satan is to be taken seriously. He is a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. He cannot be taken lightly. He is trying to lead astray everyone that he possibly can. So that means that every Christian must put on every part of the Christian armor. 
in order to be ready. Did you notice in the reading of this passage how many times Paul uses the word stand and the word withstand? He keeps saying stand and withstand the evil. You must be sure that you're prepared to defeat the enemy. Don't run. Don't retreat. I know sometimes that we go on, quote, retreats. But I remember the guy in Wood saying, you know, we might need to stop using that word so much and maybe issue the orders to charge instead of retreating. Now, in warfare, there's a time to retreat. That is carnal warfare. To retreat, regroup, reposition, get to a place that is more easily defended, and all of that. But still, we must realize the importance of standing. Taking a stand for what is right and being willing to pay whatever price is required in order to maintain that which is correct before God. Now, I want you to notice in the second place, the clothing. Let's talk about the clothing for a moment. As you read those six items that are described you'll notice that you are to girt your loins with truth. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. This was a girdle of sorts that was worn around the midsection in order to give yourself more strength in your back to withstand blows to the front of your body. And you see all these uh, old athletes that are wearing those copper things, you know, around their waists and their knees and, and elbows. And I looked at Barbara here a while back and said, I think I'm going to get me some copper. Man, that, that stuff is supposed to do miracles. I mean, you talk about Favre and, and uh, well, the other... the receiver's name. All of you football fanatics know him. Uh, they get out there and play with those younger guys and just wear them out. But this, this support around the waist is said to be truth. Girt your loins about with truth. Truth is of vital importance, isn't it? You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Be set for the defense of the truth. Love the truth. He describes this beginning in verse 14. Have on the girdle of truth and then the breastplate of righteousness. This would be to protect the vital organs, the heart and other vital organs, the lungs, all of those organs that would be easily uh, wounded by a sword or a spear or an arrow. You put on that breastplate of righteousness. And then he talks about the shoes or the sandals, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. One source indicates that the Roman soldier had shoes that had something like nails in the bottom of them. Now that sounds painful to all of us. But the sharper points were turned down and they would serve basically the purpose of cleats. We have shoes today that have cleats on them. A football player, especially if he plays in the line, when he lines down, those cleats give him a lot of, of, of stick to I guess you could say. He can stay in that place, and those cleats dig into the ground and help him about being pushed backwards. 
The Roman soldier had something very similar to that in the bottoms of his shoes so that he could stand there, position himself, and take the onslaught that was brought by the enemy. And so it is that we must have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul in another passage talked about the beautiful feet of those that proclaim the gospel. That's not just talking about preachers, but anyone who carries the truth to someone else. We are to take seriously that charge. Preach the word, he told Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. So have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he talks about the shield of faith. The shield of this particular shield that is described by a Greek term that refers to a large shield behind which you could get a lot of protection. If you watch any of the old movies from the Greek period, you may see some of those shields. And the Romans uh, use the same basic strategy. They had shields that were large enough for a man to hide behind when the arrows filled the sky. There was a Greek general once who was told that if you do not surrender, we will fill the sky and blot out the sun with our arrows. There will be so many arrows coming that It'll darken the sun. And that Greek general's response was, then we will fight in the shade. He was not going to give up. He was not going to back down. Christians need to have that mentality. We're not going to give up. We know what we believe. We know in whom we believe. And we're persuaded that He is able to keep that which we've committed unto Him against that day. That faith is so vitally, vitally important. And then the helmet of salvation. The head must be protected. If there is a blow delivered to the head, it can render one senseless. Maybe even death ensues. So the helmet was worn for that reason, to offer protection. And we all know that our mind is vitally important in our service to God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We must have the mind of Christ, and we must ever be on guard to protect our minds, if you please. Keep our senses in proper working order so that we may understand the things that are truly important. So wear the helmet of salvation. Be aware that in Christ there is salvation. And don't ever let anything or anyone lead you away from that. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is said to be the Word of God. This sword that is described here is the shorter sword that was used in close quarters and they were very deadly. I don't know if that's the type sword that Peter had in the garden when he smote off Malchus' ear, but the Lord told him, put it up. We don't need that. We're not going to resort to that type of weaponry. I'm sure that Peter remembered that for a long, long time, probably until his demise, as we read a while ago in our reading. His decease was imminent when he wrote those words. But we are to wield the sword of the Spirit. 
using the Word of God, the truth of God, to reveal error, to reveal sin and its condemnation. I really liked a comment that was made by Brother Burton Kaufman in uh, his commentary on the book of Ephesians. He said, in commenting on this passage, he says, which is the word of God? Six words that he points out is, are so descriptive, not merely of the sword of the Spirit, but all of the armor of God. And he made this analysis that I want to share with you. I don't have a slide on this, but you can check this out for yourself. He talked about the truth, the girdle of truth. He said, what is this if it is not the Word of God? Thy Word is truth. So you cannot take away the Word of God out of this first statement. And then he said, look at the righteousness that is described. The breastplate of righteousness. Didn't David say that all God's commandments are righteousness? Psalm 119, I believe it's verse 172. So there you see the Word of God in that breastplate as well. And then he talks about the gospel of peace. What is that but the Word of God? The gospel of Christ is, his, is God's Word to us today. We must receive it and allow it to direct us. Faith, the shield of faith. How does, shield, how does faith come? By hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So the Word of God cannot be separated from that item too. And then he talks about salvation. The helmet of salvation. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy three fifteen. From a babe you have learned the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. So God's Word is intertwined with our salvation. And then the final one, the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, produced by the Spirit, inspired by the sp Spirit. It has life. It has strength. And it has the power to impart the truth to all of us. Then notice the constant, as we have called it. Verses 18 through 20 talks about with all prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. Praying always, he said. Isn't that what he told the brethren at Thessalonica? Pray without ceasing. Don't let anything cut off your prayer life. I've had a person or two over the years, one man who has long since departed for his reward, was a member of the church here, loved by all of us. He came to me one time years ago and he said, Edward, I just can't pray. I just can't pray. And he was really serious. It was really bothered him. We talked. I encouraged him. You do the best you can. And God will understand. I hope that's what he did. I think he did put that into practice. And I pointed out that the reception of our prayers does not depend upon our ability to voice everything that we want to and try to maybe because God does understand. We used to sing a song, Our Heavenly Father Understands, and He does. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the Christ, who does understand what it's like 
to live in this world. But we need to pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray for all saints. Notice how he uses that word all. Pray always. I know it doesn't have the two L's in that word. But then he said, pray with all prayer and supplication. And then he said, pray for all saints. And then Paul, not selfishly, but for the furtherance of the gospel, said, pray for me, that the gospel may be preached, the mystery of godliness will be made known to all mankind. That indeed is a marvelous, constant theme for us to keep in mind. We must never stop praying. Doesn't make any difference how dark the hour is. We can pray to God. Jesus in his darkest hour talked to his Father, prayed the same prayer three times, and kept saying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. So important for us to put on the whole armor of God, the complete armor of God, and then keep on fighting and praying for that which is right and good. Now, finally, in conclusion, notice these things. In the book of Ephesians, the church is portrayed as a body a family, and an army. All three of these figures involve basically the same thing. Membership. Need to be a member of the body of Christ, a member of the family of God, a member of the army of the Lord. It involves unity. What army can prevail if everybody is in a state of confusion? Some of you have been in the military, and you can tell us that, you know, Gomer Pyle was sort of out of place. I had an ex-Marine tell me one time he would have lasted just a few minutes in my unit. (laughs) He would have been out of there because Sergeant Carter was not the typical sergeant in the Marine Corps. Barbara had an uncle who unknowingly joined the Marine Corps. When he was called for examination and so on, he said, I had a chip on my shoulder. I didn't want to be there. I was kind of a smart aleck. And when the fellow said, which branch would you like to become a part of? He said, I don't care. And he said, you go right over there. He said, I didn't notice, or I noticed there there wasn't but two or three guys in that line. And I found out a few minutes later I had joined the Marine Corps. He had some medical issues and didn't stay very long. But he said it would have been a different ball game if Gomer Pyle had been in that unit. Well, When we think about an army, we think about devotion, dedication, commitment. We think about coordination too, don't we? Whether you're talking about a body, a family, or an army, you're talking about people coordinating things, working together in unity. Remember Paul said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? Now, I'm asking you this morning, are you a member of the body of Christ? Have you made that good confession, turning from a life of sin and what we know is repentance, and coming on the basis of that faith to be immersed in that one baptism that we talked about a few weeks ago? 
And the result being that that brings us into Christ. We're baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Don't take my word for it. Check those passages out. Those who have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. And then here we have in this epistle and many others the encouragement to remain faithful. Be a good soldier. Be a functioning member of the body. Be a loving, supportive, encouraging, faithful member of, the, of a family. Paul emphasizes all of those things. But we've studied the army today. Have you enlisted? You need to enlist if you're not a member of the body of Christ, the army of the Lord. If you're an erring child of God, you've been AWOL, away without leave. The boy kept showing up at the campus of Jackson County High School from which he had graduated the year prior. Kept coming in. He'd play basketball all day long in the gym with all of us other guys. But one day there were two men who came and said, you come with us. You are a wall. We've been looking for you. And they took him back. There are some who are a wall. Well, we're not going to come with force and strength and try to force you back. But we do invite you and welcome you with open arms when you make that decision to return. Come if you're subject as we stand and sing.
to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing the first verse from number 359. Number 359. Jesus, keep me near the cross. If there's anyone that's in need of communion supplies, please raise your hand and Mike will get you one. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another opportunity to come before thy table now, Father, in remembrance of thy Son and our Savior Jesus. Father, now we partake of this bread which represents to us his body that he gave to be hung upon that cross for the remission of our sins. May all those protect you no matter what pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's bow again. Almighty Father in heaven, we can continue in our remembrance of that great sacrifice by partaking of this fruit of the vine which represents to us Christ's blood that he was so willingly willing to share to shed the blood that has the power to wipe away man's sins again father may those who partake in a matter well pleasing to thee for in Christ's name we pray amen Now we'll give thanks for all of our blessings. Almighty Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all that you give us, Father, for our health and for the material blessings of life, and especially, Father, for the spiritual blessings of life. We are so thankful that we have the ability to go into this world and work and earn a portion of its gains. And Father, we just pray that we are willing to give back a portion, Father, that would be used to help those who are in need and to spread thy word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Two hundred ninety seven will be our closing song for the service this morning, followed by our closing prayer by Brother Andy Rutherford. Of course, he's leading the prayer, but we all are to pray. And I know that we do that. I mentioned earlier that several of our members are back with us today. Uh, we're so happy that uh, we have Faye Mayberry here this morning and uh, good to see her along with Carolyn Harris. She's back there. They're uh, looking chipper and very nice, and their hair is getting more beautiful every day. I just love that color that they have this morning. And uh, Sister Lola King is able to be here today. She's still uh, taking treatments uh, with medication, and keep her in your prayers. Miss Sally Russell is here as well, and Ruby Fisher is with us. She had a big day yesterday, and uh, her daughter-in-law, Wanda, brought her this morning, and uh, Ruby was telling me all about uh, uh, Ruth and Naomi and mother-in-law and daughter-in-law and all of that, and we're just so happy to have her with us. Uh, she was with family yesterday and enjoyed that very, very much. Let's remember Alexis White. She's able to be back with us this morning, and we're happy.
for her presence. Uh, Patricia Brooks is going to be having tests tomorrow, and hopefully she will get a good report. Let's pl pray to that end. Peggy will be have Peggy Denton will be having another procedure in June, I believe that's right. And uh, let's pray that that will go well as well. She has had a, a double dose of Brian because she, she's seeing double. And uh, he just, uh, you know, just one's not enough for her. She had to have two Brian's. So we're, we're hoping, hopefully that uh, vision problem is going to be corrected. Gary Clemens, Wanda's husband, is now at home. He will be seeing a cardiologist about blockages. Let's remember him. And also, Darlene Hackett is not feeling well this morning. Uh, plus, Miss Hattie is not feeling well. So let's remember all of them. Justin tells us to be sure to complete our youth info sheets. I'll be filling one out uh, very quickly, Justin. No, this is for the young people. Please fill those out as quickly as you can. And uh, weekly birthdays includes Linda Dickens and Sherry Lester. Today, I believe, is their birthday, the 23rd. Carolyn Harris on the 25th. Emma Denton and Rick Spivey on the 27th. Addison Mayberry on the 28th. And Chris, Chris Washer on the 29th. And congratulations to James and Regina Rowland, who is celebrating their wedding anniversary today. Remember, next Sunday will be the fifth Sunday. Justin will be preaching uh, the, the morning service. And then following the Bible classes, we're going to have a potluck fellowship meal, followed by the children's class at 1215. And then at 1230, Matthew Jones will be delivering the lesson as the young men lead our services. We need to get ready for Vacation Bible School, June 7 through 11. We're going to have a door knocking on the Saturday before, or the uh, Saturday, May 29th, rather. And uh, that'll be followed by a trip to Pro Bowling West in Lebanon. So if you like to bowl, come and door knock, and then we'll go bowling later. Uh, the Bible study, Vacation Bible School, will be at 6.30 at night, 7 through 11. The Ark Encounter trip will be Friday and Saturday of June 25-26, and the church will be uh, paying the cost for those who would like to go. Transportation will be by chartered bus. We have the sign-up sheet out there. Please sign up as soon as possible. And uh, for more information, see Justin about that. We will be uh, having the the distribution of the camper applications this afternoon, 3 o'clock at the Baghdad building, and uh, they will be available here tonight. We urge all of our campers to fill one out, and any of you counselors who have not yet filled out your application, please do that as quickly as possible. We need to know of our staff members and also of the campers that are planning on going. We look forward to having a good camp We'll have that meeting this afternoon, and then following that, R.W. and I will be heading to Memphis to the Memphis School of Preaching Lectures and be there tomorrow. We hope that you'll keep us in your prayers as we travel. Are there any other announcements? Finally, we'll have our closing prayer uh, following our closing song. Then we'll have Bible study classes following that. We hope you'll stay. Let's stand for the closing song and prayer, please. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and its many blessings. We thank you for the health we have and the opportunity we have to come together of those of like-minded, precious faith and to worship you on this first day of the week, Heavenly Father. We pray that our worship here has been acceptable and pleasing in your sight, Heavenly Father, and we pray that 
uh, we take something from this service, apply it to our everyday lives, and let our light shine a little brighter when we go out into our community, Heavenly Father, that we might spread the borders of Thy kingdom. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we're about to head to our Bible study period. Help us to go in to this Bible study period with uh, open minds, open hearts as we study your word, Heavenly Father. May we take the knowledge from these classes and apply it to our Christian foundation, Heavenly Father. And please be with all those who are teaching. Give them a good recollection of the things that they have put together. Please be with us as when we finish class, as we depart from here, Heavenly Father. Keep a safe hand over us and bring us back at the next appointed time, if it be thy will. We thank you for all your many blessings, Heavenly Father, especially for Christ, who died on the cross for their mission of our sins. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would forgive us of those sins as we repent of them, so that one day we have hope of an eternity in heaven with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Lesson 12 in our book, and I don't know if there's any books floating around. Barry may try to get you one if you if you need one, but uh, we're, we are in, nearing the end of our study of <coughs> Paul's writings to the church at Thessalonica, so we may, may be out of books, but we are on Lesson 12, looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13, and we're actually going to cross over into chapter 3 and verse 5, and in last week's <laughs> lesson... We studied, and, and Johnny led us in a study of the first 12 verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in that lesson, we learned about apostasy. We learned about uh, the deception that would come, the unrighteousness that would, was already in the world. And, and he ended that, that section in verse 12 talking about those who did not believe the truth but had pleasure pleasure in unrighteousness. Those that actually had just uh, were so far involved in sin that they were actually just fully taking pleasure in their own unrighteousness. <coughs> then the word in verse 13, but. That, that contrast, okay? Literally on the contrary. So we've had a discussion on, on perdition and apostasy and unrighteousness and all the, those bad terms, those negative connotations, but now we're going to talk about something different. Now we're going to talk about what should be. We're going to talk about those <coughs> beloved by the Lord and how they're to behave and the manner of life that they're to have, those who have been separated, those who are set apart, those that are beloved of the Lord because of where they stand in relationship to Christ, and so I, it sort of sandwiched our lesson today. Is sort of sandwiched between that study of apostasy and and those negative things, and then next week we're going to look at, among other things, the need to disfellowship those who are erring. So we're kind of sandwiched in between discussions on sin and erring and unrighteousness, but Paul here is going to instruct those who are beloved of the Lord how they should behave in the manner of life that they're to have. And, and Paul was keenly aware that there was the possibility of falling away and the possibility of apostasy. Uh, and, and he's warning the Thessalonians not to, not to engage in that. Uh, Demas comes to mind, right? In, in his early writings, Paul mentioned Demas and he was one of the ones right alongside Luke and others who was, was there. He was faithful. He was needed. He was working for the Lord. And when Paul wrote his last letter to Timothy, what did he say about Demas? He's forsaken me, having loved this present world. And, and that's a lesson to each of us, a powerful lesson that let's not get too arrogant. Let's not get too high and mighty about where we stand in, in relationship to God because it is certainly possible for us 
to fall away as Demas did. And so Paul didn't want that to happen to the, the church at Thessalonica. And, and Paul was one, he wasn't one to just baptize someone or baptize a group of people and walk away and leave them. Now, now he, you know, he, he would move around. I mean, he was a missionary, but he continued to stay in touch with these congregations. He continued to pray for them, as we'll see, and he continued to, to support them in what ways that he could, even though maybe he wasn't able to be there in their presence every Sunday when they worshiped. He was still very much keeping them in mind, keeping them in prayer, and, and wanted to instruct them and encourage them. And so in our lesson, uh, we'll read just the couple, first couple of verses, beginning in verse 13. Paul said, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It had to be comforting to these people who were still under persecution to have Paul write to them and to know that he's praying for them. And we talked about prayer in, our, in Brother Edward's lesson this morning, and, and Paul prayed for them, and we're going to see later on, he asked them, the church at Thessalonica, to pray for him. It, 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 it's a two-way street, I guess, for Paul. He, he was praying for them, but he also wanted them to pray that, that he would be able to continue to preach and that the gospel would, would run and, and be uh, spread throughout the world. Now, this idea of, of beloved by the Lord, I want to touch on that because it is the, the title of, of our lesson. Um, you know, I think sometimes we... I don't want to say we do a disservice, but when we when we say God loves everybody, um, that's true, right? I mean, God does love everybody, but I, I feel like we probably would be better served to personalize that a little more than maybe we do. That God doesn't just love everybody. God loves me. God loves you. I mean, we could put our name behind it and, and use our name and say, God loves us on a very personal basis. Uh, it's not that just he just loves everybody. He is, it's a personal relationship that we have with God. And, and God uh, and loves everyone, yes, but those who are in him, those who are in Christ are described as beloved by the Lord. And it's a, it's a more personal relationship and I think having that personal relationship gives us a better footing to stand on as we face the trials and hardships of life. These Thessalonians, these, the church at Thessalonica, they didn't have it easy. I mean, these are the, they, Paul was run out of town. So we, and we talked about that over and over, the fact that Paul, he was kind of run out and the church at Thessalonica had to stay behind and, and deal with persecution that we probably uh, maybe can't fully understand because we've never experienced it. Um, but Paul had to call, call them to, and remind them through his letter that, hey, you're beloved of the Lord. You've been sanctified. Uh, you've been chosen for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in, in the, the truth. Uh, God, God, we see through Paul's writings, has, has a couple of, of sides. There is the, the side of justice and righteousness and sin will be punished. But there's also the side of love and the side of, I'm going to take care of those who are mine. I think it was Jeremy's lesson where he covered uh, chapter 1 of the book in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1. And I've always kind of focused on uh, the flaming fire and the vengeance in verse 8 on those that don't know God. And, and that would have probably been somewhat comforting to the church at Thessalonica to know that those who were persecuting them were going to be punished, that that persecution wasn't going to last forever, that ultimately they were going to be, be punished. But that verse 7, that first part, and to give you who are troubled rest. You see that other side to God, that those who are persecuted, those who are 
beloved of the Lord who are ultimately going to be given rest. It may not happen in this life, but ultimately we're going to have rest. And uh, we may go through persecutions. We may go through, we will go through trials and hardships because everyone does. But ultimately we're going to have rest in Christ. Mary, yes. Communication and interaction, what good is it? If somebody loves you and you never meet them, if somebody loves you from afar, it, it, it takes that connection. And God has come to us, and if, but if we don't go to Him and develop that relationship, what good is it going to be to us? And the thousands, millions of people that don't develop that relationship, they don't have that connection, they don't really understand that God loves them because they never reach out and you take hold of them. And you know, it's it's to your point. It's it's possible to reject love, isn't it? I mean, we see that all the time that that kids grow up and reject their parents' love, or 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 other examples that we could throw out. And so, it's certainly possible to reject God's love. The call goes to all, but not all will accept the call. And you're right. We have to have that relationship and that communication. And it's not an arbitrary decision. Right? We're not beloved of the Lord because he just arbitrarily chose to love one person over another. But we are beloved of the Lord if we have taken the steps to obey him, to come to him and obey what he has asked us to do. We've responded in obedience to that call, which goes out to, to everyone. Other comments? Appreciate those comments. So despite their persecution that they're going through, their faith is growing, and for that, Paul is thankful. He says, we're bound to give thanks to God for you and uh, those that are beloved, beloved of God. I do want to, to point out verse in verse 14 two, two words that I think jump out to me. Uh, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word called and that word obtaining, to me, emphasize, emphasizes God's part and ours. Right? God does the calling, but we have to do something to obtain and answer that call. It's, again, not just an arbitrary decision. It's something on man's part. And sometimes there are those who, who say man has nothing to do with his own salvation. Well, there is an obtain. If you if you obtain something, that means you had to have some effort. Uh, you had to reach out and, and grab it. That's that's obtaining. That's some effort on man's part to obtain what is what is offered. And this calling is not some miraculous calling down mm -hmm. hit you in the head call. Sure, it's the gospel. Gospel is a call for all. It is. It is. Verse 15, he continues and says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions with which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. That, that term, stand fast, and that was uh, part of Brother Edward's lesson this morning. He talked about uh, a little bit about that. That term, stand fast, I found it multiple times in Paul's writings. Uh, he, he mentioned it to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16. He mentioned it a couple of times in Philippians in, in chapter 1 and chapter 4, and then in Galatians, Galatians 5, he, he said, stand fast. So over and over, stand fast, stand fast, stand fast. It, if you mention something one time in the Bible, I guess that's enough, but it jumps out to me when he mentions it over and over that, hey, that's pretty important. Stand fast, over and over. Uh, and, and when I think about what that means, that standing fast, I think of, of being rooted. Paul talked about being rooted and grounded and loved. And you think about that big, big oak tree that has a deep root system and it holds and it stands fast. The winds come and the storms and the snow and the ice and, and that tree stands fast. I go, go on farm visits sometimes to, and, and home visits to look at trees and, and you have a sick tree, and that's one of the toughest things to figure out what's wrong with it because you can't look at the roots. 
Right. Somebody comes, somebody calls you to come and look at a corn plant or a tobacco plant. You can pull that up and look at it. One corn plant out of a out of thirty thousand in an acre, you can pull that up and it's not going to affect their yield. But somebody calls you to look at their shade tree, you can't exactly pull their favorite shade tree up and look at the roots. You just kind of have to speculate. Uh, but if you don't plant a tree properly, those roots it may live healthy and good for for a few years, but eventually it's going to have problems. I've I've seen pictures of where folks have have pulled trees up. They maybe made it seven or eight years and they pull them up and they had bought bur ball and burlap trees that still had the wire and they didn't take the wire off of the, the root system and that wire just, the tree grew into it and it killed it. Or uh, maybe they, they had a pot, a tree in a pot and it stayed in the pot at the nursery too long and those roots will go, go around that pot if it stays in there too long. And if you don't prune those roots before you plant that tree, It'll continue growing in a circle. It'll choke that tree to death. Uh, and it's hard to identify because again, you can't look at the root system, but we, we know and we understand that a healthy root system is really important. And if you don't have that, that tree's not gonna last very long. Well, as Christians, if we don't have that, that root system, if we're not grounded, then we're not, it's gonna be hard to make it through the storms of life. And, and we're going to face storms. We not, may not face and, and hopefully won't face the same kinds of persecutions that the Thessalonians faced, but we're going to face storms. And if we don't have that root system, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to stand fast. We're to be like the tree planted by the river water. Yes, ma'am. And bring it fruit in season. It leaves, does not wither. And whatsoever we do, shall prosper. Yes, ma'am. Psalms, Psalms one, absolutely, and that's uh, that analogy to the tree is, is pretty powerful because we've all seen the, out in California those big redwoods. Seen seen pictures. I've never been out there, but I've seen the pictures of the the cars driving through those, and it's just amazing. But that's how we're to be: is to stand fast, and we can't do that if we don't have a good root system. Now, how do we get a good root system? Study, yeah. Uh, are we still known, and I've heard Brother Edward mention that uh, Christians used to be known, the, the members of the Lord's Church used to be known as a walking Bible, that you could you could ask them questions and they, they could quote scriptures just like Miss Ruby just did from Psalms. Do we still have that reputation? Um, and we're never gonna know everything, but uh, we, we just have to continue to study and, and try to be as rooted in the scriptures as we can be. But that, that idea of stand fast, again, is really important here because what's he just talked about? He's talked about apostasy. He's talked about the son of perdition. He's talked about the fact that there, there are those who are unrighteous and those that are, that are involved in sin. And he's gonna, gonna talk next week, not to get into Josh's lesson, but he's gonna talk about Hey, there's going to be a need to walk away from those who don't do this, who are disorderly. So for you all, the church at Thessalonica, I need you to stand fast. I need you to be rooted. I need you to be grounded in the scriptures and continue to hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So these, this word traditions is a little different than the word that we use for traditions or the, the thought that comes to our mind. We have traditions, right? We have family traditions, not, not the kind that Hank sang about, but, but our own traditions that we have that we pass down from generation to generation. And even in the church, we have traditions. We, uh, until COVID, we shook hands with people when we greeted them. We have traditions about when we meet and what time we do this and what order in the service we do things. And we're not bound by scripture uh, for those things, but Paul's not talking about those human traditions. He's talking about the teachings. And uh, that's probably a better <laughs> translation of the word. I think the NIV and, and other versions render that word teachings. And so they're not traditions that Paul just came up with and is trying to get them to go along with. These are actual teachings that he's passing to them, um, both in person 
and through his writings. And he mentions that in, in 1 Corinthians. He uses that same word uh, in chapter 11, verse 2. He said, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So that word traditions, but he goes on to tell the Corinthians that those traditions aren't, aren't from him. Uh, that same chapter in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, he said, For I received them from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed <coughs> took bread. So those traditions, again, weren't from him. They were from the Lord. Uh, again, in 1 Corinthians, in, in chapter 15 and verse 3, he said, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, and the more I study the, the writings of Paul, the more it just comes out to me. He is just constantly emphasizing the fact, almost having to defend himself, <laughs> that, that what he's passing along to him is from the spirit from Jesus. It's been revealed to him that it's not his idea. Uh, and in various books, he, and we studied it in First Thessalonians, that he had to point out that what he had received, that it wasn't from him, that he didn't just come up with this. And, and, and most, uh, many of his writings, he does that. But even today, Paul, his writings to a lot of people just don't carry the same weight. And, and you'll see that argument made. If you try to quote something from, from one of the epistles of Paul, people will... Well, Jesus didn't say that. That's, that's words of a man. That wasn't out of Jesus' mouth, and so I'm not going to believe it. Well, again, Paul was an inspired apostle. He spoke by revelation. He, this wasn't just a man's opinion, wasn't just a tradition of man, but was rather a teaching that was to be obeyed. He had the authority because he was inspired. I mean, he was inspired just, just like the other, uh, other writers of the New Testament. I find it very interesting that people are still trying to pick apart things that are within the, the Old and New Testament as being not from God. And why do you think it ended up in that book in the first place? Do you not think that God has the power over the years to put in there what needs to be in there and keep out what didn't sure. need to be in there? But people, their God must not be as powerful as mine, yeah. I guess. They just they don't want to listen. I'm sure they're, you know, developing their own Bible from their own thoughts. Yeah. I'll take this part, but I don't know. Sure, let's pick and choose. And it wouldn't be that's a that's a good point. It wouldn't be really fair for God to allow us to have a book full of stuff that that's not all his, that's not authentic. For him to just allow us to have a book where, hey, there's some stuff in there I really want you to follow, but this other stuff that's in there was written by a man, and it's okay to ignore that. Well, God God wouldn't allow that to happen, so that's that's a good good way to look at it. Good point. Josh? Chris, these traditions, and like you said, teaching, probably a better word for us to understand. It's going to be involved in Chapter 3 and next week's lesson, too, but... Uh, he taught these people explicitly when he went to visit them to help start the church. He's reemphasizing it in the epistle. And he also wants to lead by example, too, because he mentioned do as we did, I assume he meant him and Silas and Timothy. So uh, he is really trying to reemphasize multiple times because this is all fresh to them. We have it in the scripture, we can refer to it, but he wrote to them and he was teaching by example. He was really trying to set things straight from the get go. Sure. Good point. <coughs> And it, it wasn't, according to the, the research I did, it's not been very long since he wrote 1 Thessalonians that he's writing 2 Thessalonians, maybe, maybe a year. And so I, I, he took, sent, the, sent the first letter to them, and they came back with questions, and, and now he's responding to those. Um, but he really does want them to, to be faithful, I, I feel like, because he just understands the danger of sin and the danger of falling away and how easy it is to not stand fast and hold the traditions and the teachings that have been sent to them. 
Um, so let's continue with our reading in verse, uh, beginning in verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word, word and work. Finally, brethren, there's that word we learned about this morning. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So after he's encouraged them to remain faithful, he expresses his, his desire for Jesus and God to bless them in, in these endeavors and, and that they're going to they're gonna live a new life as, as young Christians that's different and that should look different. That kind of goes back to that word but that we, we mentioned at the outset. The, that it's supposed to be contrary, that they're supposed to look different than, than the world around them, and a lesson for us as well. But then he asked his, his fellow believers to pray for him. Um, and I think that's powerful. I think that would have been powerful to the, the young church, that here's this missionary who taught us the gospel, and he's wanting us to pray for him. Uh, I don't think any of us would describe Paul as weak. I don't think any of us would describe Paul as lacking trust in God. And, and yet sometimes we, we maybe get the idea that it's, it's a sign of weakness to ask for help or a sign of weakness to ask somebody to, to pray for us because we're going through a struggle. But, but that's not the case at all. In fact, it may be the opposite. It's a sign of strength to know that you need the Lord's help and the help of, of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And certainly, Paul, we wouldn't say lacked faith in God, that he lacked trust in God, but yet he still, even though he has confidence that, that God is going to provide, he still asks for the church to pray for him, for that to happen and that, to ask God for that help. It didn't stop him from asking uh, for prayer. Uh, that word... That word uh, in verse, let's see here, uh, that word run, I didn't write the verse down. Let me see here. Chapter three, verse one. Thank you, Johnny. Pray for us that the word of the Lord might run swiftly. Did anybody else's translation say something different than swiftly? Free course. Free course. The word comes from, uh, and, and I'm... I'm no expert, but uh, treco, I think, is maybe how you pronounce that. To proceed quickly and without restraint. Sort of this unbridled spread. Uh, some translations say speed ahead or spread rapidly. So he didn't, he wasn't simply asking for, for people to, to receive the word and maybe it's sort of this lackadaisical. Hey, some, maybe if I throw this message out here, some will, some will hear it, some might believe. Paul is real. He wants the word of God to spread rapidly. He wants it to run, to swiftly go through uh, because he loved people. He loved the Lord and wanted people to be saved. It was important to him that, that the message run and, and get out there. And he was... Yes, confident that that was going to happen, but also understood the power of prayer and, and wanted that on his behalf. Comments on, on that? Paul uses running the race. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the words he used, diligent, uh, you know, those, those words that require immediate and strong effort are always used by Paul. And all of us know that if we get lackadaisical, if we slow down, if we take too much rest, or we it, things won't get done, they won't happen, and and you'll just if you don't watch it, you'll become 
what's the word I'm looking for? You'll uh, petrified. Yeah. Get stiff, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I've actually heard that. I've actually heard that used. You know, if you don't watch it, you'll yeah. be petrified. Yeah. Yeah, that's another way. Our own body will do it if you don't use your muscles. Yeah, I mean, that is. That's a, that's a good way to put it. And you hear that people that retire and just sit around and do nothing, a lot of times they don't last too long. I mean, you, I've seen people that retire and just go home and die. And it's really sad and unfortunate. And then there's those that, hey, they'll retire from one career and go to another and, and continue or even just gardening or working around the farm or the house or whatever, but if you got to be doing something. Well, that it depends on how old they are when they retire. That's probably true, true Miss Barbara. That's probably true. But yeah, we can get stiff. We can get, uh, as you say, lackadaisical in the work of the Lord and rust up, right? Be, be ineffective, and he didn't want that. Uh, and I think we have to remember this is a young church, but these... These lessons are very applicable to those who are older Christians as well as those who are younger in the faith. And uh, again, Paul wasn't one to just establish a church, let's baptize you into Christ and, and walk off and leave. He understood that there needed to be a continual growth, continual learning and growing in the, in the Scriptures. But I, I do think as we, as we close here that uh, it, ju it just comes to me that where this is between Josh's lesson next week and Johnny's this week, it's it's a warning to this this church to keep going, to stand fast because there's there's the danger of apostasy. We know that some are going to fall away and that you're going to have to withdraw maybe from those who have, have fallen away. But for you all in Thessalonica, I want you to to understand who you are, that you've been sanctified, that you're beloved by the Lord, you're His, and to continue to stand fast and uh, keep on keeping on. Jeff, uh, uh, I, I appreciate uh, those of you that have stu stuck around for Bible class. Uh, Jeremy is in Crossville, so I don't know who's ringing the bell, but it seems like it should have rung by now. But. That's all I've got, unless any of you have some. So. Yeah, it, in in some ways it has. Yeah.